Well, good morning, Felipe. Good morning. I'm here with Felipe Ronova. Hi, Justin. I got it right. You got it right. From <laughs> from Sensa Industrial, somewhere in Mexico. Where exactly in Mexico is your business based? We're in Tijuana, right on the border with San Diego. Ah, so close by. Close by. Yeah. You could almost swim across if it wasn't for the barbed wire. Uh, you can. Uh, it's <laughs> not recommended, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so obviously we're going to explore your story implementing SPE at Sensor Industrial. But before we do that, let's talk about, the, the, let's uh, give the viewers the headline, if you like. What, 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 what have you achieved as a consequence of this journey? Well, we've uh, grown our sales uh, 26% in, it's around 10 months. And uh, we've seen a much better uh, uh, teamwork. We're working together now. It's usually difficult to have that with customer service and sales. So we've seen really two really great sides uh, uh, out of working with SP. Excellent. And do you think, so t I guess two questions, can you maintain revenue at its current level or can you, it, it, can you continue to grow w with a similar rate of growth than you've had previously? We're growing actually more than we did before. We we'd grown uh, the uh, like I said, twenty six percent the year before. We've grown thirteen, so we've seen even more growth. We did see a little. Uh, uh, I mean, it, we we were a little flat the first three months, but we really we've really seen the results very quickly. Uh, and uh, this we want to expand it. So we right currently we have three inside sales and we're looking to get at least one more this year and uh, we know we'll, we'll, we'll get more sales. Excellent. So let's wind back to the beginning. So tell our viewers about Sensor Industrial. What do you sell? We sell mostly punches and dies and abrasives to the uh, to manufacturers in Mexico. Uh, th that's our sales. Our sales model is mostly focused on consumables uh, and uh, we have, we're distributors and most of what we sell, we do convert some abrasives, discs and belts, but mostly we're focused on manufacturers. That's where most of our sales are going. And are your principles in Mexico or do you import from outside of Mexico? Our principles are in Mexico and uh, we do uh, have a, basically a warehouse in, in the US where we do the import for most of the products we sell. Maybe 50% of what we sell comes from the US and 50% uh, comes from elsewhere. Uh, and uh, th that's where, where we are located. Excellent. And you, can you give us a sense of the size of the company, revenues, number of employees? Yeah, we have 23 employees. We sell uh, four, four and a half million dollars a year. Uh, and uh, hoping um, and with this system, I think I, I know we'll, we'll grow it even more. Excellent, excellent. So let's start. Let's go right back to the beginning. Uh, what was the state of sales uh, pr prior to discovering uh, us? Like, uh, and and how did you discover SPE in the first place? Well, I have, through some of the associations I've been with, I, I don't know if it was in one of the industrial associations, I, I heard about your book. I uh, bought it, uh, I think, on a Friday I received it, and I started reading it, and I couldn't take it off. I, I, I finished it in two days, and I really wanted to implement all that I'd seen there. I, and I, I saw that you were uh, in Austra from Australia, and I said, oh, man, I don't know how I'm going to be able to work with it, but uh, we're, we're, we're pretty close by, and uh, everything worked, and we were able to, to, uh, to work with you the, the two full days what yeah. So for those people who, uh, before we get to Pardon? that, for those people who are watching, I'm not actually in Australia. I live in Los Angeles. So I guess you found that out at some point. <laughs> and that was great. I mean, we, we were close enough there where we could work together, and, and pretty quickly. Uh, I think a, a month after we, I finished reading the book, we we got together uh, for the workshop. Yeah. So we're jumping ahead here, but what actually happened is you and some of your team drove over the border. I guess it's a three or four hour drive here to Los Angeles from Tijuana. Exactly three hours. And we ran a two day workshop, but we'll get to that in a minute. First, talk to me about why you were interested in sales in the first place. I mean, presumably there were things you didn't like about the sales function. Otherwise, there would have been other books you could read on the weekend. I totally, I mean, of course, I started reading your book and uh, I, I really, I mean, you were touching most of the our pain points that we have 
one being uh, not really being able to monitor uh, sales activity from our sales reps, um, not really controlling the sales process, uh, having sales reps do uh, controlling all communication to the customers. And it, it was very difficult for us also to implement any sort of campaigns. We could do a training, but we really couldn't control what happened after that. Uh, yeah. And uh, we also had some friction so between that, sales I'm and I'm guessing what you mean is you, you train people on a, you train salespeople on a, on a new line that you wanted them to promote, but then it would be up to the salespeople whether or not or to, to what degree they actually promoted that. Exactly. If they like the line, they would probably promote it. And maybe out of uh, the uh, seven sales reps we had, maybe one liked it and would sell some, and then the other six didn't like it or weren't comfortable selling this new product, and we would, would get nowhere. So it's hard for you to separate. If a product isn't performing well, it's hard for you to determine whether it's the performance problem is with the salespeople or whether the performance problem is a product market fit issue. It was very difficult for us to 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 know that and, and uh, to get any uh, feedback from uh, these campaigns. It was even more difficult to to really know what was happening uh, back then when we would just tell the salespeople sell this product and give some training and go ahead and, and try to do it. I mean, it it was really difficult getting any new products in for sales. And salespeople's activity levels, I'm guessing they were involved in customer service and writing proposals and the like, as we often see. Yes, they uh, they would be all over customer service all the time. When's my quote ready? Did you get this quote to the customer? When's this order going to arrive to the customer? I mean, I, I would say 80% of their conversations were about customer service and not really about sales. Uh -huh. And I'm guessing your salespeople were, most, were, were outside or supposed to be outside at that point? Uh, they were outside, uh, seven outside sales. We did have one inside sales, not with the SPE model. Uh, and we had some, seen some encouraging news with that, this uh -huh. person. Uh, uh, so we, we knew the inside sales uh, position was something we really wanted to grow. We just didn't know how to do it. Uh -huh. Excellent. So we ran the two day workshop uh, and we came up with a plan in the two day workshop. Uh, do you want to describe sort of the key points of the plan that we hatched or the model that we designed more specifically, I guess? Well, so, so, some of the more impactful were uh, getting a, a campaign coordinator. Mm. Uh, that, that's the first person we, we, you mentioned we would be looking for. We also had the seven outside sales and we kind of figured that with two, we could do the same uh, sales activities that we did with the seven, uh, and uh, we uh, planned on two inside salespeople and one uh, co coordinator for this. So, um, yes, that's what uh, kind of the, the model that we worked on. So to paint a picture for the viewers, what we decided was to have two inside salespeople and they would become your core sales team. Uh, to have the two inside salespeople own and prosecute all opportunities from end to end, but to push discrete tasks to, I think, two field specialists on the occasions that they needed field activities performed. And then the idea was to have upstream from the, upstream from the inside sales team uh, to have a, um, a um, campaign coordinator who is responsible for topping up the inside salespeople's opportunity queues? Does, it, does that describe it? Exactly. Yeah, then that, that's what and, ended up. And then, of course, uh, was there a need to um, beef up customer service? Yes, we did hire one more. We had two people in customer service. We did hire one more. Uh, it was one of your suggestions, and. Uh, it, uh, didn't visualize that we would uh, have all these uh, more these needs for that customer service uh, would have to uh, cover the sales reps for doing them, and we needed customer service to do this instead of the salespeople, and that's uh, one why we added one more. There. Okay, so that was the model that we conceptualized, and we did a lot more in the workshop. We talked about how to make the transition and so on, but the bottom line, I think we we. I'm just looking at the model here, actually. We've got a, a customer service team consisting of uh, a couple, uh, two or three CSRs and a subject supported by a subject matter expert. 
And then, as I described before, we have two inside salespeople with a desire to grow to three, pushing activities to two field specialists in the field and supported by a campaign coordinator replenishing their opportunity queues, hopefully daily. So that was the plan. Yes. And uh, actually, it, the plan that you uh, g gave us, we, we basically did it in the exact same order and we're exactly where, where that uh, plan you designed. And we have the three inside salespeople, we have the campaign quarter, we have the, 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 the coordinator for visits from the field sales, we have the two field sales. Oh, the field, okay, the so I, yeah, on the chart, there's a field scheduler. I wasn't sure if you added that. So we had inside salespeople pushing field visit mm -hmm. requests to a field scheduler and then a field scheduler planning the calendars of your, of your field specialists out there in the field. Uh -huh. And the, at first we had a campaign coordinator doing some scheduling and then that same person we decided to keep as scheduler and then we hired a, a campaign coordinator and an individual campaign coordinator now. Okay, so let's talk about making the transition. You guys just went back and made the transition pretty quickly, I, th I think, from memory. Yes. You yes. I mean, this is the new order. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we took, it did take me a month of negotiating and talking with all the sales reps. Uh, and finally, after talking with most of them, we kept two outside sales reps. One of the outside sales reps became the, the product specialist. Uh, and one, one other became an inside sales. Uh, one of them didn't really like the new model and, and left the company. And the other... Uh, we just decided we didn't need that coverage because th th that person was uh, somewhere different in Mexico and uh, we really did just needed the two outside sales people. So that that's how the, it, it was a month long negotiation with everybody yeah. to, to set everything up. Uh, so that's for, how better, we did. for better or worse, you lost two field sales people. Now, most of our clients, that doesn't happen to, but most of our clients don't attack it with the same uh, ferocity that that you did. You made the transition. Ba you, I mean, you talked about it for a month and did the whole thing in one go. So, for better or worse, you lost two field salespeople. You converted one to a field specialist, one to an inside salesperson, and you were left with two, two presumably the two most capable, most willing to travel in the field. Exactly. That's what we did when we, they. Uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, th then you added, I guess, a new person in your inside sales team to 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 round up to to start with your initial inside sales team. You started with two, exactly. We and actually we did we we started with two. We hired one more, and when we hired that one more, we hired actually two more. Uh, and there's a an interesting story there. We really weren't uh, checking the calls that the inside salespeople did, so we ran into an issue with one of the four that we had that he wasn't really making the calls and um so that that's why we kept three but we it was interesting that you i, I know you had mentioned in the process that we should really to take care of the details and look at the numbers yes. and make sure everything's correct and uh what we find we, we found out about it yeah i mean most of most of the organization well certainly the organizations that we work with who go down this path they have a big screen on their wall and they can see the calls accumulating over the course of the day in real time and mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean if, if three hours into the day the volume of calls was was off track then th then uh they would be held to pay we wouldn't normally let it go more than a few hours before we fix an activity volume problem yeah that sounds much better than <laughs> wait three months we waited three months for that <laughs> yeah you want to be really sure that this person wasn't doing any work mm -hmm, exactly do, now do, do you measure activity do you have any idea of activity levels at all do you know how many meaningful selling interactions your inside sales people are having a day now yes currently our goal is 25 and uh we're around 17 is our average okay. of, uh, of, uh, we and we have uh, slots or call tries. We're between fifty and seventy a day, and the, the, we have seventeen uh, meaningful sales calls. Yeah, so that's a little low. I mean, seventeen isn't terrible. We would like to have kind of twenty as a minimum. But if mm -hmm. you're getting twenty as a minimum, you would expect a lot more attempts. Uh, in your case, you're at the low end, but you don't have a lot of attempts. So I suspect that either you could. You get a lot of uplift from adding a supervisor mm -hmm. uh, or if there are activities that the salespeople are performing that they shouldn't be doing you want to get rid of those activities actually you you really need to do both you need to find whatever is distracting them get rid of that and then have a supervisor actively managing the team and 
you know, if you if you break up their days into a couple of sprints, so mm-hmm. they sprint and then relax, sprint and then relax. I, I, if you're hitting 17 without that discipline, you will get to 30, I suspect, you know, with good supervision. And that's, if you think about it, adding a supervisor uh, is a lot easier to, to get that extra throughput than adding another one, adding another salesperson. I see what you mean. Yeah. That, that, that sounds quite reasonable. Because then you end up with a better, I mean, the, let, let's say the, the result of adding a supervisor is the same call volumes that you would have if you added one more person with the current model, but it's, it's, it, you're still better off with a supervisor because with a supervisor, you've got a better managed team and you've got, and you've got more consistency and you're going to, you'll be, you'll sleep easier at nights because you know that somebody's actively managing that team. So yeah, I would add a supervisor next. The supervisor will pay for themselves straight away. Uh, and, uh, and, and then you can grow the sales team easily w- once you have those disciplines in place. I see what you mean. Okay. That's great. That's, that's, uh, great advice. We'll work on that just like we did with the other ones. <laughs> great. So 17, 17 conversations, 17 selling conversations a day across two people is still good. Talk to me a bit about the change in sales activity levels, both the, 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 uh, inside sales activities, but also what happened out in the field? Are there still visits occurring to your customers and potential customers? Yes. What, uh, basically for the inside salespeople, uh, we, we've seen that they, they, we can train them. The process that I really like is we can have a very short training and right the next day they can start trying to sell the product. Yes. There's something very complicated to do with the outside salespeople. That's something we, we really liked about it. And regarding the field salespeople, uh, they always go to a visit, to visit a customer with one specific objective. And it was really tough to do that before. Also, yeah. now we can really connect a campaign to the opportunities to getting, uh, the process flow of, of the sale and, and getting to the point where when that field salesperson goes, there's one specific objective that that person is, is trying to accomplish. Exactly. And the, it's probably a, a nicer way to work for the field specialist than it was previously, where they were trying to ferret out sales opportunities themselves and, and probably doing a lot of sort of a cat management calls when they did visit face to face. Exactly. I mean, it, it, it did take them time to get accustomed to it because they would all still want to be in the loop on everything. Yeah. But now we're at the point where they're very happy because they go there, they, they uh, accomplish their objective. They uh, put everything into an email that is later put into the CRM, and uh, and then they, they can just focus on the next call. This they couldn't do this uh, before. Mm-hmm. So talk about the from the customer's perspective, the amount of attention they're receiving now versus before. Obviously, there's a lot of telephone activity happening, but what I'm interested in is in aggregate today versus with uh, versus the aggregate of activity that you had previously. I'm guessing the f- amount of phone contact has gone up, uh, but but to what degree, have you thought about to what degree have we increased the volume of telephone conversations and the volume of face-to-face visits or decreased? Yeah, we, we've we improved in the way that there's a lot more touch points from our company to the customer. It used to be there, the only touch point was a sales rep. And that's basically the sales rep didn't want customer service talking to the, their, their, their customers. And now the customers now see us more as a company because they can talk to a, the customer service rep. They, they can talk to the an inside sales, the field sales, and also the uh, product engineer has really helped us too because now they, they see, oh, there's one person that's very knowledgeable that works in this company. We didn't have that uh, before. Yeah. Well, you, you kind of did because you had that person before, but that person was in the field. So they were probably inaccessible most of the time to most of your customers. That's exactly what, what what had happened before. Now they're accessible because customer service is protecting them from all of the uh, tedious things they would have been doing previously, the plain mm-hmm. vanilla stuff, and because they're not expected to sell, they're simply a uh, they are they're available for either customer service or inside sales, whoever needs them. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and now. We still thought that he would have to visit some customers, but we found out that it's much better for him to stay in the company 
and he'll he'll be a, a lot more productive and impactful if he's here uh, servicing inside sales, customer service, and Absolutely. even field sales at Calm. Yeah, send a send a field specialist out with a torch and and Skype on their cell phone and uh, and video share the problem back to the subject matter expert. We've all already done that uh, at least a dozen times, I think. That way, we're, they can help to so solve ten problems a day instead of two. Exactly, that's what we've seen. Uh huh. So um, the the volume of activity. Uh, the what what I want to get at here is I just want to check off that customers aren't feeling neglected. Okay, I see. Yeah, well, first of all, we, we have some uh, uh, important customers. So they probably, maybe 10 customers represent like 30% of our sales. And uh, we still have them. And we've actually grown the sales we have with them. Because now, for the current customers that we have, we can work on new products to sell to them, which we, uh -huh. it was really difficult to implement before. Now we can do specific campaigns to them. And uh, we can sell them even, we're, we're actually selling them uh, more products than we did before. And it's one of those customers, those are the customers that we thought we'd be kind of scared to, to get into this model, but we've seen the exact opposite. They're, they're more engaged with us now than they were before. Yeah, I mean, the irony is that previously your salespeople were probably servicing them. And the mm -hmm. best thing you can do to keep customers is sell them. Because, of course, the more lines they buy, the more embedded they become, the more entangled they become with your organization. Exactly. The That's higher the switching do. cost. Mm -hmm. So what about customer service? Obviously, your customer service team is processing orders, generating quotes, and handling all the day-to-day -day business as usual type run rate business. Mm -hmm. uh, what has been the impact on the customer's perception of service quality? I think they're, they're getting to talk with people that are more knowledgeable about customer service than they did before. Uh -huh. Before, they would have to ask questions from, from the salespeople. Where's my order? When, uh, how am I going to have it? Where could I, uh, how can we improve this? And it was only basically the salesperson calling customer service and getting that information. Now the customer has access, direct access to them and uh, to people that are very knowledgeable about the customer service process. Uh -huh. and, uh, so the salesperson might have had more technical, may or may not have had more technical knowledge, but I guess where routine repetitive transactions are concerned, the information that the customer wants is more likely to be biased towards the operational. In other words, where where is it? Exactly. And, and that's and the information you, the salesperson you want to talk doesn't about know. For that. Exactly. The salesperson doesn't know where it is because they're in the field driving around. Yeah, that, I mean, that's improved a lot. And also, I think we've empowered customer service because usually they they, they were having to probably uh, ask politely to the salesperson if they could talk to the customer. And now <laughs> it's just there's a problem. We need to solve it. And they solve it. And they talk to directly to the customers now. Now, your remaining salespeople, this was obviously tumultuous for them. They, see, they saw two of their colleagues leave. Mm -hmm. One get la one get lassoed inside. Oh, two of them get lassoed inside. One turned into an inside salesperson, which must have been horrifying for them to watch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but but the two two of them are remaining in the field as field specialists, having visits pushed to them. Uh, how how has the transition been for them, and and how is their sort of quality of life now compared to previously? Well, it's it's really great for them that they can they no no longer have to own customers like they did before, right? They have the account and they be called any time of the day. Now, every, all all calls for for uh, transactional purposes, and I would say most of them are just sent directly to customer service. Their uh, cell phones don't ring that much now. Mm -hmm. The sales reps' cell phones they they don't have it because they 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 just focused on their objective. They accomplish it and then they go to the next call. And they're happy. They're happy. They're happy. I mean, they're uh, very much more engaged and much more uh, team members than they were before. And you know what the great thing is, and nobody ever thinks about this, but um, if your competitors, um, if your competitors approach your salespeople. Well, they're not really salespeople, they're field specialists, but to your competitors, they look like salespeople. If your competitors approach them and say, would you like to come work for us, even if they offer them more money, when they talk to your salesperson, what they're proposing is, well, you, you come over to our organization, 
you get paid a low base with the potential to earn commission, but the potential is kind of overinflated and they will know that. But basically a day in their life will consist of sitting down, flicking through the yellow pages, looking for people to sell to and hope and hopefully building a customer base so they can earn a reasonable income at some point in the future. I mean, that must, given that yourselves, the field specialists are happy in their current position, that must be a less alluring proposition than it was in the past. Exactly. And, and actually, I've had that happen with the inside salesperson that we hired, uh, worked for an office supply company distributor, and uh, 90% of his work was customer service. And he was stressed all the time, uh, very tired when he got home, and uh, he has nothing close to that now, he, even though he's, he's an inside sales. I mean, he really likes it, and he's uh, he, he's told me uh, openly, I mean, you know, don't know how much stress I've relieved by working here. Yeah. So it's a double win. I suspect the economics of your sales model, the fact that it's more, much more efficient than the old one, would actually allow you to outbid your competitors for the better salespeople. But you probably don't need to, because once somebody's, want, once somebody's worked in this environment, they wouldn't want to go and work in the traditional sales environment. Uh, totally agree. Yes. Exciting. So uh, r remind us of the of the of what we started with the 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 growth and uh, where do you where do you see it going? How do you see yourself growing from here? Well, we've grown twenty six percent in the past ten months, and uh, we were, even these months. I mean, January and February have been record months for us. So we still see the, the growth. It's very easy to to see what's coming also on the on the pipeline. It was very difficult to really visualize what what we could expect in, in growth in the next few months. But we already have, uh, I think, at least eight candidates for really good new businesses that we should close this month. And we, and we have it all specified and working on them with, within one of the campaigns. So uh, uh, we're very excited. And uh, uh, I really thank you, Justin. I mean, this, this has really changed our, uh, not only our sales and the, the numbers, but it's really uh, impacted on, in the quality of life of everybody here. And uh, we, we, we thank you for this uh, opportunity that we had to, to work with you. Yeah, you're welcome, uh, Felipe. It, it's, it's, it's been an honor. So uh, c congratulations. And uh, uh, we'll get you back when you get to, what's the next milestone? Five million? <laughs> well, that, that's a good milestone. We'll work on it. Hopefully we'll get there in, in uh, less than the, the year. So we'll, I, no, I think we'll, well, it's, it's too easy. Maybe ten million. <laughs> <laughs> so you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Excellent. We'll we'll get you back. Th thank you so much, Felipe. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Thank bye you. bye. Bye.